Hi guys, Amber here. Welcome back to In Conversation with ATF. My guest today is a voice actor, best known for voicing Will of Tarkin in Star Wars The Clone Wars, the animated series, or is that the CGI series or the cartoon? I think we refer to it as the animated series, yes. The animated series, yeah, that's the one. Um, Star Wars Rebels and The Bad Batch. Admiral Redis. Radis, I, I'm so sorry. Radis. Radis. Radis in Rogue One. Griff Halloran, did I pronounce that? I'm so sorry. I should have forgotten to check beforehand. Griff Halloran, yes. Griff Halloran from Star Wars Resistance. Randy Rabbit in the director video Garfield specials, which I fondly grew up with. Literally, that was the, my childhood. Honestly, um, Tomax and Zamos in GI Joe Renegades. Ben Kenobi in Star Wars the Skywalker Saga. It's just been released. Smitty and Needleman in um, Monsters at Work. Pete Puma in Looney Tunes cartoons and many, many more. My guest is Stephen Stanton. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here, Amber. Sweet. Yeah, it's lovely to be. Yeah, it's lovely to be here with you in this little Zoom call that we're kind of getting closed in right now. <laughs> So I'd like to start off by asking, how are you? I'm doing great. It's, uh, you know, um, it's a hot day here in Los Angeles. So we're just kind of dealing with the heat and uh, getting ready for the weekend. Well, that's cool. Good for you. Yeah. We, it doesn't really get that hot in England, to be fair, if I'm totally being honest. I mean, well, I don't know the hottest I've seen it is about 28 degrees. And that's in Celsius, by the way. So mm -hmm. don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but... You know, <laughs> um, so I know you obviously this is a this was a rare case because you're not known for doing podcast interviews or so I've been told by other people. But you watched my Neil Ross interview and you were like, yes, I, I, I want to do this. So, wow. Have you seen what other interviews have you seen? Well, I've, yeah, I've known Neil for many, many years. And uh, if you enjoyed that interview with him, I don't know. If, um, I don't know if you had a chance to read his book. Not yet. Yeah, it's his book is uh, really interesting. I would uh, definitely recommend it. But I also saw that you do uh, videos of uh, the coin operated rides that you <laughs> see outside of like, supermarkets, grocery stores, uh, malls. Uh, yeah, which, you, uh, you know, I grew up in uh, in Tampa, Florida, and we used to have our fair share of those at all the, uh, the shopping plazas and everything. So I'm uh, very much. Um, familiar with a lot of those and actually you know have, have partaken on many as a youngster so oh so cool yeah I'm not sure if you're aware on my channel um I was the voice of one of them actually ah. one of the rides um I'll get a photo of it up of course I do this every it was my first voice ever job okay it was probably <clears throat> one of the most exciting moments of my career probably and I'd like to introduce you Stephen, this is Helly. Ah, there you go. I did the voice <laughs> of this awesome. ride. Yeah. That's absolutely fantastic. I know, yeah. Um, unfortunately, only two were made because of the pandemic. Uh, the company who made it actually shut down because of the whole COVID-19 situation. Um, so only two were made. There's one in refurbishment here in England. There's one all the way in Iceland. Wow, you know, that reminds me uh, a long, long time ago. This is uh, probably in the very early 90s. One of my first voiceover jobs was for the Taito Corporation. In, uh, and they were making a, uh, a it, was a, it was an arcade sort of, I don't want to say a game. I guess you'd call it a game. It uh, was called the D3 Boss. Very difficult to find. It was going to be only uh, made uh, manufactured for Japan. And what it was, was a, a sphere that you got inside. And once you were inside, you chose the adventure that you wanted to go on. And there were simple things like, you know, a dog fight in a biplane, uh, skiing down a mountain, you know, the, the rapids, riding the rapids in a, in a, in a raft or a canoe, something like that. But the, uh, the sphere that you got into was on two axes so that you could spin all these different directions. And so once you got inside that thing, I mean, there was inside of it, there was a, a panic button you could press to stop it. There was a air sickness bag in, in, inside of it. And so in case you got motion sickness, uh, you had something, <laughs> something to relieve yourself in. 
And uh, it was the craziest thing that I've uh, I've ever lent my voice to. Uh, I don't think it was ever ever brought over here to the United States. I think because of insurance reasons, I don't think they would have ever allowed anybody inside one of those. But I remember when we were testing it out, uh, somebody that I was working with at the time went inside, and um, as soon as he got in there and the thing started spinning him upside down, you could hear all the like, loose change in his pocket and his keys all flying out inside the thing. It was. Uh, it was, a, it was just a wild ride. I don't know whatever became of it, but uh, that was one of that was one of my first voiceover jobs a long time ago. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I just got another voiceover job. I can't say much about it, but it's for a ride in America. I voice. It's like sort of it's. I, I voice an animatronic rabbit for the ride. Her name's Press Stella, and she mm-hmm. talks in a British accent like this. So the producers were like, "Yeah, hire her." So <laughs> I've just had that. Um, booked um i'm excited to do that definitely um we're not talking about me let's talk about you Stephen. um now i know we have a few mutual friends so i'd like to start off with that of course we've got two of my most favorite people in the world frank welker and Corey burton oh What's yeah i'd like to know those guys <laughs> Well, they, you know, they both have been in this uh, entertainment business for so many years now. Uh, it's always fun to, to, to work with them because, you know, I was a kid and I was listening to their voices growing up. You know, uh, Frank Welker has been doing Scooby-Doo since, what, 1968, 69. And I actually have done a few episodes of Scooby-Doo with him because now he does um, uh, both Freddie and the voice of uh, Scooby-Doo as well. So it's uh, it was really a lot of fun to work with him on those um, on those episodes. You know, Frank goes back to uh, I actually have on DVD. He was on the old Dean Martin roast uh, show on the dais and he was uh, introduced as an impressionist. You know, yeah. the young new impressionist Frank Welker. And he was doing all the popular impressions of the time, like Walter Cronkite and, you know, probably, you know, Cary Grant and, and Jimmy Stewart, all the the. Uh, actors and celebrities that people knew back in the 1970s so it's been great working with frank over the years and Corey is absolutely one of my favorite people in the industry you know i've gotten to work with him both in the star wars arena and uh at disney you're working on the disney parks rides and so forth because we both do uh voices for the seven dwarfs Uh, Corey is grumpy you're happy to, to completely happy, polar opposites. <laughs> yes, I do the voice of happy. So we've had a chance to work together on um, the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train ride that's uh, at Walt Disney World. It's been there for a number of years now, a few years now. It's a really nice uh, upgrade to the sort of animatronic technology that includes, I don't even know what it is. It's like 3D projection and all kinds of things that make the characters really seem like they come to life. So, but Corey and I, we've worked the most together, I think, in the Star Wars arena on, you know, shows like The Clone Wars. And, and um, I just love the guy. He's, he's great and a huge talent. Uh, he's wonderful to work with. Oh, well, it's great to hear those words coming from you uh, for, both, for both men, Corey and Frank. Yeah. Um, Frank, I am meeting in Edinburgh this October. Um, it, I was originally meeting him in 2020, after, uh, you know, like October 2020. I got pushed to 2021. Now this has been pushed to 2022, and I hope it doesn't get pushed to 2023 because I am desperate to meet Frank again. I haven't seen him since before the pandemic. He's such a lovely guy. And Corey, um, he helped me on a project. Um, I was doing a documentary and I interviewed him. It's what we spoke for six hours. I haven't heard from him much recently, but you know. You, you know you, you just you just miss these people even though they live like thousands of miles away from you and you feel like if you don't talk to them anymore you do you stay friends or do you just lose touch and then you have to re-become friends with them it's it's kind of hard but you know yeah Corey's doing a uh, private signing I've heard with SWAU if you do are you doing one as well or have you completed yours Yes, yeah, so I actually, uh, well, the uh, the send in the deadlines for the send in has has ended, but uh, I haven't yet uh, sat down to sign the pictures yet. That's still coming up uh, later this month. But yes, um, Corey's also doing a signing with, uh, as we like to refer to it out here, SWAU, S W A U, Star Wars Autograph Universe. Yeah. 
Ah, uh, I see. Swayu. Yeah, I call it Swal, but you know, Swayu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll use that from now on. You've inspired me, Stephen. <laughs> um, so I'd like to ask you um, about a few other of your uh, few, um, few roles outside the Star Wars universe. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to start off with Smitty and Needleman from Monsters at Work. Now, you took over from Dan Gerson, the original voice actor who passed away before Monsters at Work, I presume, went into production. So what was it like recording for that? And were you asked to do a direct impression or were you asked to put your own spin on it? No, I was uh, I auditioned to do a voice match for the characters. So they really wanted something that sounded at first um, as spot on as the way the two guys sounded in the uh, in the original motion picture. And um, once we got into recording, they really thought that there needed to be a little bit of delineation between the two characters. So Needleman, who is the tall, thin one, I usually do his voice a little higher. And uh, Smitty, who is the short squat one, I usually do a sort of a, a lower, rounder version of, uh, of, of that voice um, so that there's a little bit of a difference between the two and they don't sound exactly the same. But otherwise, we're trying to, you know, pretty much stick to what it, uh, the way they sounded in, in, in the motion picture. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, I haven't been in the studio for over two years now because of the... Uh, the pandemic so I've been recording everything at my home studio but prior to that when I was recording at Disney TV animation it was it was a lot of fun because the uh, a little bit different from the way that a lot of other people work in at on this particular show the creatives like the director for or a writer for a particular episode would come in the booth with you and uh, they would record uh they would direct you in the booth and they would we throw ad libs back and forth or they rewrite things on the fly. They're very open to new ideas. And they have another booth um, that's adjacent to the main booth and someone can go in there and read lines with you. And they're completely, the microphones, there's no overlap. So if you accidentally step on each other's lines or you overlap each other's dialogue, it's not a problem because they can't, each of the microphones can't hear the other person. So we do a lot of that where, uh, you know, there's a lot of interaction with the, uh, the writers and directors right there in the booth, which is really unusual for voiceover. Usually they're behind the glass in the control room. And, uh, you know, they're always pressing down on the button to give you a uh, direction by the microphone. But on this particular show, they like to be in the booth with the, uh, with the actors. Cool. Now, uh, if you don't mind, could I hear some of your voices? Just to select a few, maybe some of your favorites. I'll try not to do uh, to blow out the microphone. But so Smitty and Needleman is like, you know, they're a. Uh, Why don't call me stupid? What do you think I am, dumb? And then the other guy will say like, Oh, I didn't think you were that dumb. I just thought you were a moron. So, you sound exactly like yeah. Dan did. That is, it's so cool how like people can do voice matches and you sound and you're thinking when you listen to it with your eyes closed, you're thinking that's Dan. And you're like, it's not what? <laughs> it's amazing. It's like they've just jumped into your voice box. That other person, it's just amazing. But Dan, Dan did a wonderful. You know, he he, he created two very you know just lovable, goofy characters. You know, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be able to kind of like carry the baton and and bring them, you know, bring them back to life, you know, for another whole generation of people to watch. Now, I'm telling you, I grew up with the original film. I know it was released a few years before I was born, about three years before I was born. But obviously it's like a little kid around probably Boo's age. Um, I, I grew up mm-hmm. with, uh, continuously watching the film. I could remember it scene by scene, script by word by word, line by line. And you know just now what watching monsters at work as a 17 year old 18 year old it's just you grow it feels like you're growing up with the exact same thing like you're not just a part of the old generation you're a part of the new generation now not sure if you can say well i know henry winkler's pretty much confirmed it i think is there a season two of monsters at work unless 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 there's a formal announcement your guess is as good as mine i think i think henry wink I did say on Twitter something about a season two, so I'm not entirely sure, but I hope there is because it's a really good show. That's Henry. That's uh, <laughs> I can't say I can't speak for anybody else or the, for the producers or uh, or for Disney or so. You'll just have to wait and see. Oh, 
have you met Henry by any chance? I know I'm not sure when you recorded for Monsters at Work. Was it before or during the pandemic? It was before, but uh, Disney tends to. I have met him, you know, just in just in my neighborhood, actually. But um, um, we record everybody separately on the on those kinds of shows. They do not do uh, a lot of group recording uh, at Disney. They put each actor in separately. And then if they already, if someone, like if there's a character that you're having a conversation with and they already know the, the multiple takes that the, the person has laid down for like their half of the conversation, you'll lay down multiple takes for your half of the conversation so they can kind of match them up and see which, you know, deliveries and intonations and all those, those kinds of things work. So there's a, there's a lot of um, recording multiple takes because they have to be prepared for anything that uh, the next person might do. That's fair enough. Yeah. Um, so on to the Garfield um, specials. Do you remember recording for those? Now, I believe those were ensemble recordings because I have seen behind the scenes footage of Frank and Jason Marsden and pretty much and Greg Berger as well. Pretty much the same class who went on to do the Garfield show as well. So was that served as like a sort of pilot or a test to see if a Garfield show would work? Or I'm not even sure if you guest starred on the Garfield show or not. Or was it just in those films? No, I was just in the films. I wasn't, uh, my character didn't show up in the, uh, in the TV series. Although a lot of, I think some of the voice actors from the movies went on to do the, the TV shows like uh, Wally Winger, people like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they, those were, uh, those were originally made. I think the first one was originally made for a uh, theatrical release. And um, it ended up not going theatrically in the United States, but in other parts of the world, it was released theatrically, and I believe in Turkey, it outgrossed, in the cinema, it outgrossed uh, Ratatouille. So it made more money than wow. Ratatouille, did, which is uh, fascinating, but I guess they love their Garfield in Turkey. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's sort of like, it's pretty much, apart from some of the characters not being in the TV series, it's pretty much, I just, I, in my mind, it's just telling me that it was, it was, recorded and produced as a sort of way to see if it would work like would Garfield work as CGI or something like that um so recording sessions for that I've got to ask what were they like I know it's a bit of a generic question but obviously everyone was there uh, they were they were a lot of fun they were pretty laid back as far as production uh, goes so you know we had a good time doing those I believe Neil Ross was in the one if not more than one of those I remember distinctly working with Neil and Frank Welker on on those shows and I believe Tim Conway came in I think on the third one oh yeah because he was a little frog in a fun fest yeah it was was really wonderful to work with Tim Conway because you know I used to be a big fan of the Carol Burnett show growing up as a kid and some of his other things like McHale's Navy and you know used to see him on television all the time so it's always it's always great to be able to work with people that you've, uh, you know, you've admired over the years and enjoyed their talent. So, yeah, they were all together. I would say it was, you know, it was a really pleasurable experience. There's, um, I can't think of anything that, you know, that went awry or, you know, there's no kinds of stories like that. It was just a, a really well-run show and um, we had a lot of fun doing it. Well, that's really good to hear. Definitely. Because as I said, Duffel Gets Real was probably one of probably was my favorite film growing up was like a uh, like a I can't even remember what year it was released probably as like a six-year-old I believe I can't remember exactly but it's really good yeah definitely um I like to ask now okay Tom Max and Zane Moss now I know in the original G.I. Joe American Hero cartoon Zane Moss was voiced by Corey Burton and then you took on the role for G.I. Joe Renegades so were you asked to do a voice match or were you asked to put your own little spin on it? No, they didn't want any sort of voice match or anything. They just wanted to get your original uh, take on it. So, you know, I I did what I did on the show. And unfortunately, you know, as, as much fun as those uh, those were to work on, you know, the the series that got the plug got pulled on it, I think, because the live action G.I. Joe films were coming out. And I'm not sure if there was they didn't want confusion or competition. So. Those two characters I only got to do in two episodes, although they were they were a lot of fun to do. I, you know, they were and the episodes that I was in were I thought they were they were fantastic. And it was it was a great cast. But we just, um, 
you know, that the, you know, the series got uh, ended prematurely, I think, because of the G.I. Joe films. Yeah, well, that's really odd because I know, obviously, you know about the live action Transformers films, right? They, mm-hmm. The first one was released around the same time as Transformers Animated. Um, I don't know why, like, the show wasn't put, the plug wasn't pulled because of the Michael Bay film. I don't, I don't, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> all I do know is that Charlie Adler voiced Cobra Commander in Renegades and also Starscream in the 2007 Transformers film, just like how in the original Chris Latter voiced both Cobra Commander and Starscream. So that's really cool. Um, is there any voice actors that you've worked with who are no longer with us? Did you ever work with June Frey or anyone like that? Um, no, I never worked with June. Uh, I haven't. I never had the opportunity to do that. Or, or one of your favorites, I would have loved to have known or worked with Bill Scott. Um, <laughs> he's, you know, did so much work that the Jay Ward uh, cartoons in particular were a big influence on me uh, growing up. Once I came to, uh, to Hollywood uh, back in the 1980s, one of the first places that I went to was uh, Dudley Do Right's Emporium on Sunset Boulevard, which is no longer around. But the statue where the, you know with of Bullwinkle and Rocky, I don't know if that's still around either. I it is. It's on Sunset Boulevard. Okay, they repainted it over the years, and Jay Ward's studio was in there. And I went into that store and I bought. I still have what I what I bought there. I bought a script from um, a copy of the script of one of the Bullwinkle episodes, and uh, they had all all the original cells there for sale from all the Jay Ward shows, including all the, uh, the cereal commercials that they did uh, for, for Quakers. So like yeah. Captain Crunch. And Quisp Quisp. and Quake. Yeah. They had all that King Vitamin. Uh, they had all that stuff there, but I was, you know, a starving film student. I couldn't afford any of that stuff. However, since then I've managed to pick up a few of those cells, actually some of them uh, that were from that, uh, that store that ended up at a, cell collectors uh, place in Culver City so a few years back I picked up some of those uh, cells so now I have uh, Quisp and Quake and Captain Crunch all uh, hanging on my wall at home but uh, yeah it was a it was a I used to have a few of the catalogs that they they sent out too and some of the flyers they were all crazy it was, it was like reading Mad Magazine they just had this crazy warped sense of humor in everything that they did but um, it had been wonderful to uh to work with those guys you know that's so cool i mean yeah the dudley do right emporium i believe jay ward's wife billy worked behind the counter i'm not sure if you saw her really? when you went yeah yeah i may have it may have been her that was you know serving me that you know i just i have no idea i was brand new to the area but uh there were a few things that i knew i wanted to see once i got here and that was one of them hmm, what what makes me wonder is oh Right, because I because I see the two names Ramona and Billy, but her name was Ramona, but everyone called her Billy. So yeah, it, that kind of confused me a little bit. But now I know. Um, so I'd like to ask you um, now. According to behind the voice actors, you're in the book of Boba Fett. Is this true? Yes, in episode uh, two or chapter two, whatever they call it, I play the uh, the Pike leader on the train that gets. Uh, you know, sort of like hijacked and destroyed there as the uh, Boba and uh, his people uh, take over it. So I do the voice of the live action Pike character. Oh, wow. In the Clone Wars, I had done a character called Marg Krim, who is the leader of the Pike Syndicate. So in animated form, I had done the voice of that character. And this was uh, my first time doing the live action version of the Pike. And I think that show I don't know if that was the first time we saw the Pikes with their mask off. I think I think that might have been. But uh... the reason why I asked that is because I've seen it on behind the voice actors, but on your Wikipedia page, you're not credited at all for Book of Boba Fett. So I just I was like, oh, what? I just I just wanted to check with you. Yeah, so that that obviously Corey's reason... in it as the Cad Bane. So yeah, that was yeah, terrific. Reason, I I didn't get credit on the show, and that just happens. Oh, sometimes. did you not? Oh, that's probably yeah. why. You know that just. It happens, especially with voice actors. Uh, sometimes you just fall through the cracks. And, uh, you know, once it's out there, it pretty much kind of stays the way it is. But uh, definitely, uh, I definitely was the voice of that character. 
I'm presuming you must have announced on social media because if you're not credited on the show, then how how do people find out? That's the thing. I definitely announced it on social so that's media. That's probably why they put it on behind because the I was so like happy, I was so excited to be a part of that show, and especially be, to, to be doing a Pike since it was a character that I had an affinity with. Uh, you know, so I thought, oh, this will be great. And then the show came out, and it's like no credits. Come Aww, on, that but, sucks. Uh, and yeah, I talked to the powers that be about it. And they were like, hmm, sometimes, you know, somebody made a decision somewhere. And uh, that's just the way it happened. Yeah. Well, if Corey Bone can get a full bone frame with his name on the screen with Cat Bane <laughs> in the background, you should get one as well. Well, thank you. Well, you definitely deserved it for the for bringing that character to. to I cried. Uh, I physically cried. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I'm hopefully coming to America this summer. So I'll be busy going around everywhere to all the different places and stuff like that. So I'm quite excited. Yeah, it'd be really nice to meet Corey, definitely. But I don't think that's a possibility considering it's so it's getting closer and closer to when I'm coming over. So mm-hmm. maybe next time. Yeah. Um, so you've done a lot of attractions i know you said before like the seven dwarfs mine train um are there any other attractions that are your favorite like do you, what other attract like voices for attractions have you done and do you, why, why well, are they I, the favorites yeah i've been for uh for multiple parks around the world right now i'm the voice of uh iron the iron man character either in the attraction where they have them with like in Hong Kong or the walk around character that you speak with uh, that you meet out in the so I've been and been having a lot of fun this has been going on for a number of years now doing the Tony Stark Iron Man character oh that's cool uh, yeah and another one of my favorite um, voices is also in Hong Kong it's in a an attraction called uh, Mystic Manor and I do the voice of uh, Lord Henry Mystic, you know. He's a very sort of uh, 1800s, you know, British explorer. He's part of the, uh, I think he was part of something called the Adventurers Club. I, Disney fans will know more about that. I think there's a restaurant tie-in or was. And Mystic Manor is sort of their version of the Haunted Mansion. Frank Welker actually does the voice of the little monkey companion uh, for my character, in that, oh, wow. uh, in that and yeah it was it was it's an it's an amazing it's an amazing attraction with a lot of new at the time very new technology that we haven't seen here in the states and in some of the other parks uh where they're at the end when the whole museum that lord henry uh has his collection of you know antiquities and knickknacks and things everything comes to life and the room tears open and there's a cyclone outside it's uh, and it's one of the it's a it's a trackless ride too. So even though you're in something like the Dune buggy, Dune buggy, there's no track on the floor. It's all automated and uh, very high tech. But that's uh, that's another one of another another one of the rides that I've been involved with uh, that I would love to see eventually come to uh, one of the parks in the states because uh, I haven't had a chance to see it myself yet in person. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you because, well, to be fair, I've never left England. I've never been abroad before. So that's why America's my number one place to come to as soon as I get my passport, because obviously there's you've got to go to the, the Florida parks and the ones in California. Um, I think the ones in Florida, there is a lot more like theme parks there. I mean, they have what, probably one of the probably one of my most favorite rides that I really want to go on Dudley do rides Ripsaw Falls at Universal <laughs> Studios Orlando so yeah definitely yeah have you ever been on any attractions any of these attractions and heard your voice oh yeah absolutely I mean I grew up in Tampa Florida so I was uh, around when Disney World opened so I got hooked into that you know that sort of got the theme park bug very early on and um I've ridden on some of the attractions where I've heard my voice for a while. For a number of years, I was the voice of the steamboat uh, captain on the rivers of America at Disneyland. So I got to hear myself, you know, do that. Uh, it's always, always fun. And uh, so, yeah, and then and he, I haven't been yet on, because I haven't been to Walt Disney World in a number of years now. So I haven't yet heard or seen uh, how the uh, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train ride came out other than what I've seen on youtube where people have gone in and filmed it but i'm looking forward to trying that one out one day too 
Great, yeah. I, w- I want to know as well, have you done anything for Disneyland Paris? Yeah, I've done a few things for them over the years. Uh, most of the time, it's either been uh, the character of Happy from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, mm-hmm. or it's been uh, Stinky Pete from uh, Toy Story. Oh, yeah. There's She's done a few tracks as him. him. Yeah, and sometimes we do, sometimes the stuff that I've done for Euro Disney is... Um, is uh, most of the, it's usually live, a live uh, attraction, something that's only going to be there for a certain amount of time for a celebration or something like that. But uh, yeah, I've gone in a, a number of times and uh, recorded for them. Wow, you're in Disney. I haven't heard that name in years. I know. Wow, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, <laughs> my parents were calling it that in the 90s. Now they're just calling it what I call it, Disneyland Paris. I really should have turned a light on it. It's really dark now outside, but you know, I guess this is bright enough. So, you know, I just, I'll just sit I back and chill like this. Okay, well, that's good. I'll, I'll turn the brightness up a bit more if it gets a bit darker, you know, because it's England. When it's about nearly nine o'clock now, it goes dark. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you, back on the subject of Star Wars, um, have you heard of the new Obi-Wan series coming to Disney Plus this May? And I know you probably won't be able to say if you're involved in it or not, but are you excited for it? I'm very excited for it. You know, I can't, uh, I can't wait to see what they, what they've done with it. Since I've, I've had the chance now to play, you know, old Ben Kenobi for a number of years, starting with uh, the video games, Empire at War and Battlefront Two, the original Battlefront Two, oh, yeah. and um, Star Wars. Let's see, Battle Pods, I think. Well, I, yeah. So I've, and then of course in Star Wars Rebels, uh, the chance to do the. Uh, the big uh, fall, uh, excuse me, the the uh, mall fight in the Twin Suns episode. So it's been it's been great to be able to portray that character. And now I really want to see what they're doing in live action to kind of extend that story, especially now since in Star Wars Rebels, we kind of touched upon what he was doing by himself on Tatooine during that time when Luke was growing up. So, yeah, I'm very excited. Oh, well, that's cool. That's great to know. Um I just had a really good question, but it's just flying out my head. It was just a bear. Oh, yes. Um, it says on Wikipedia, you are a voice double for Alec Guinness. Alec McGuinness? I, I can't. Is it, is it McGuinness or Guinness? It's Guinness, yeah. Guinness. Al- Alec McGuinness. Um, so did you play Obi-Wan at any point, taking on Alec's performance? So I'm not sure I understood the question. Um. So if you're if you're a voice okay let me f- rephrase it if um you're a voice double for Alec Guinness what mm-hmm. roles of his have you done like oh, with, uh, like pretending to be his voice Ben Kenobi that's <laughs> oh is he Ben Kenobi I I, yes. I was gonna ask is he Ben Kenobi but I was too yes. afraid of hearing oh no he wasn't Ben I'm like oh I'm getting everything wrong <laughs> yeah yes, in the original Star Wars trilogy he's the he's the Kenobi character. Ah, I see. So what's the difference between uh, Ben and Obi-Wan? Okay, I'm going to admit, I've never seen any of the old Star Wars films. I only really watch Clone Wars and Book of Boba Fett so far. <laughs> yeah, so what's the difference between Obi-Wan and Ben Kenobi? Just educate a little on me here. Well, I think we're going to maybe find out some of that in the Kenobi series. The Ben Ooh. Kenobi is kind of a, you know, it's kind of a a fake name that he goes by so that people don't know he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, he's, right. he's in hiding at the time that he's on Tatooine. No one's supposed to know that he's there. If you watch the Star Wars prequel trilogy where Ewan McGregor plays the younger uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you kind of get the idea of, okay, he has to go on, on the run now because they're trying to kill all the Jedi. So he decides to, uh, you know, hand the baby off to uh, uh, Owen, um, Uncle Owen and uh, Aunt Beru. And he's going to stay in the background on the planet and um, in hiding Mm -hmm. and uh, watch over Luke. But I have a feeling uh, we may end up finding out a little bit more about where the name Ben comes from. Oh, that sounds really exciting. Can't wait. I heard it's been delayed by about two days, but at least we'll get two episodes instead of one. Oh, the moon's just signing through. I'm so sorry. Um, (laughs) 
I'd like to ask you, have you been to England before? I'm sorry, like, you know, I, I kind of like laugh and then I just suddenly go on to the next question. It's how I am with my autism and everything like that. So I just wanted to apologise for that if I'm sort of like giddy and stuff like that. No, that's fine. I, I haven't been to England. I, I would love to, to come visit sometime. I uh, just never had the occasion to do it. I've had, you know, family members that have gone there and uh, my managers have done movies over there, worked in, uh, in England and in Scotland. And um, so, yeah, I've heard a lot about it from a lot of friends that have been there and spent time there and made good friends over there. But I haven't been there myself. No. Yeah, you, you definitely need to go. Not only do I live there, but um, where was Star Wars for? I believe it was filmed uh if i'm not mistaken it was filmed was it filmed at pinewood studios i could be wrong I, no no it was it was filmed at yeah yeah there we go it has served as a production facility for every star wars film made since the 2012 ac acquisition of lucasfilm by the walt disney company so yeah pinewood is in Buckinghamshire and they are known for creating a lot of Hollywood movies um what I know them from is they made the Carry On films I'm not sure if you ever heard of them sure I absolutely have and of course they have the 007 stage there which I think for many years was the largest sound stage in the world yeah yeah definitely yes yeah, I really I really really want to go to Pinewood like for a tour or anything I don't know if they do tours or anything like that but I just, you know, I just... I, Sounds like a good idea. It's just so big and, you know, a lot of people have filmed there, like a lot of Hollywood stars, and you think, oh, surely they, they would have never heard of Buckinghamshire before, and then there they are. You've got a uh, thingy filming at, uh, insert the name celebrity here, filming at Pinewood Studios in Buckinghamshire, England. You're thinking, what? That is amazing. Like, it's just... It's nice to know that there's little places in England that get acknowledged by these big artists. Uh huh. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd like to ask, um, just out of genuine curiosity, what do you do in your spare time? Like, do you have any hobbies outside of voice acting? Spare time. That's a that's a good one. I haven't heard that one in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm I'm kind of a uh, you know I've been a movie buff since you know I I I, I kind of like grew up on cartoons and films. And so at a very early age, I uh, started making uh, Super 8 films with my friends, you know, just like in the J.J. Abrams film, Super 8. Uh, and that's pretty much, uh, that was always how I occupied my time. I was always making some kind of a film. I mean, I, I used to draw on things like that when I was younger, but I really, once I started getting into filmmaking, that was kind of how I uh, spent most of my time. And even nowadays, I... Um, I uh, spend a lot of time either um, doing things like my stop motion films. I have a bunch of uh, stop motion films on my YouTube channel that um, uh, I made using uh, a lot of the old action figures that I grew up with, which is like in your country, it'd be known as Action Man. In my country, it's G.I. Joe. Um, so it was Action Force of... over here. Action Man, I think, was a completely different person. Yeah, because G.I. Joe over here was known as Action Force because I own a few VHS tapes downstairs that are labeled Action Force, but are G.I. Joe. So they're really I'm cool. Talking about, I'm talking about even the older ones than that from Palatoy. Oh, was around and they had the license from Hasbro to make oh. uh, G.I. Joe in, in the UK and they called it, uh, they just called it Action Man. And it has, you're oh. right, it has evolved into much something much bigger and grander than yeah. those. Uh, well, the TV movies. show is called Action Force here in the UK. Yeah. Like, I suppose there is that. So uh, I have a lot of those and that because stop motion has been a love of mine. Uh, you know, I grew up watching Ray Harryhausen films and I uh, worked with Phil Tippett, who did a lot of the stop motion for the Star Wars films. I worked with him for uh, on a number of projects. And then one of the other things that I've done also in my spare time is I try to take classic books and uh, turn them into audiobooks for uh, school kids to use uh, in, in their assignments. The one that I have on my, um, my YouTube channel right now is Treasure Island. Oh. And uh, it took me about a year and a half to record that in my quote unquote spare time. So, <laughs> but it's, it's become, you know, kind of a, a mainstay for a lot of uh, students, especially uh, uh, advanced placement English students, AP English. Um, they uh, use it for their assignments. So um, it's really very gratifying to read the comments uh, for all the kids that say it, it helped out with their homework and 
it was a lifesaver or they're not good at reading and their comprehension is held by listening to the audiobook while they're reading because you know treasure island was written in the 1800s i believe yeah and uh, yeah. has a lot of sort of antiquated language and also a lot of seafaring pirate vernacular in it so it's got a lot of terms and things in it that just don't make any sense when you read it you know it's it's like, well, what are they talking about? So I, you know, try to do my best to make it. I do all the characters in there. So there's like 32 different characters and I do a separate voice for, for each one of them. So good on you, Stephen. That's really creative. I, I yeah. like the sound of that. I might do that. Yeah. It's I... available for free, like I said, on my YouTube channel. So in each chapter is its own little video. So there's yeah. 34 chapters. It seems easy. Yourself... Anyone could do it. Yeah. 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 On the subject of stop motion, I have to bring this up. Have you seen Wallace and Gromit? Ardman, oh, yeah. best stop motion animation studio, in my opinion. Yeah. Ardman, uh, they've done some just, it's just some of the funniest, you know, the humor is great. And the stop motion, so they really kind of help push the technology forward at times when a lot of other people weren't really doing anything with stop motion. And the kinds of things that you'd see in their films, whether it was, you know, like motion tracking, uh, you know, just camera moves and a lot of stuff that was just, you know, w wasn't common to see in a stop motion film. It was they've, they've done wonderful, wonderful work over the years. I agree. Definitely. Yeah. So my final question for you, Stephen, before we wrap up this little interview, um, are you working on anything at the moment that you can talk about that's not being protected by an NDA? Hmm. That is a good question. I don't know that there's anything that I'm definitely working on stuff, but everything so far that I know right now is all NDA. The most recent thing that I can talk about was what I mentioned before was the, uh, the Lego Star Wars Skywalker saga game, which was just released. So we had to keep that under our hat for a long time. Wow. And, uh, a lot of fun to work on and, you know, just uh, Lego does a great job. They, their their writing is always very funny, and they they try to stay true to the original Star Wars films. So um, yeah, and this thing is just monstrous. I think there's over 300 characters in it. So I'm just kind of like <sighs> making my way through slowly. I started with A New Hope, you know, with the beginning, and I'm going to try to work my way through all the other chapters. But it's going to take me a while. Yeah, well, I think I think it's good to talk a little bit like that, considering it literally just got released now. What a phenomenal game. I'm thinking of getting it myself, to be fair. I mean, I can't remember what platforms is it. Yeah, Xbox One and PS4, I think it's on. I'm not sure if it's on the Switch or not. It but... is on the Switch, yeah. It's on the Switch. Oh, is well. it? Okay, well, yeah. in that I don't case... know if you can find it anywhere. It's been sold out every all over the place, but it's definitely for that platform as well. Wow. So how much... How much do you think Star Wars has had an impact on your life then, Stephen? <laughs> well, I, I have to say it has a it has a a fair a fair amount of impact, especially since you know I saw it as a as a kid and it made an impact on me just growing up, especially as a as a very young filmmaker. You know, George Lucas was uh, considered, you know, kind of a trailblazer, a young maverick, and uh, he and Steven Spielberg were like, you know the two directors that were in their early thirties making films, which is not something that was common at the time. So uh, he had a, had a great influence on me about the kinds of things about getting a career in filmmaking, which is originally what I came to Los Angeles for. I went to film school. And so, um, yeah, it has, it's had a, it's had a, an amazing uh, effect, especially since it's gone on for so long, it used to be, you know, something would come out and, you know, you'd see it in reruns, you know, the movie and maybe there'd be a TV spinoff show, but not something with the longevity that we're seeing today. So it was very surprising to me that I'm actually actually working on something that is what you would call Star Wars, because who would have thought these many decades later it would still be around? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a good statement there. Definitely. Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. Where can we find you on social media, by the way, if you want to see more of your work or even hear more of your work? Well, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Stephen underscore Stanton. And then uh, I'm also on um, YouTube as Stephen Stanton and on Facebook uh, as Stephen Stanton and, um, and on Instagram as well as Stephen Stanton, the number one. 
So if no matter what platform you are, you're on, you can find me. <laughs> Sounds good. To you at home, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to go check out Stephen on all of his social media. I thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share with your Star Wars friends and many other people. Stay safe, stay happy. Oh, and always be kind. Thank you for watching. We'll see you around. Bye. And cut.